Good morning. Good morning. My name is Pat Callahan, and I'm one of the trustees for the Springfield, Vermont Unitarian Universalist Church. I'd, wel I'd like to welcome you all to this March 26, 2023 live and hybrid service featuring Nancy Crumbine, the Reverend Nancy Crumbine. If you're a guest, we would give you time at the end of the service to introduce yourselves. And we hope that you stay for our coffee hour, either here at the meeting house or online if you're on Zoom. We appreciate each and every one of you. And we thank you for sharing this time with us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a beautiful March morning. I want to shout out to a few people here this morning, uh, to June, for this. She miraculously found this etching of Charlotte Perkins Gilman on the front of the program. And you Zoom people, I think, got it on your email. Um, it just made my day. I was so thrilled when I saw it. Thank you, June. She's just, just an angel. She does all sorts of mir miracle things around here. Um, I want to give a shout out to the group that has been meeting, I understand, since I was last here, the 1619 group. Um, you know, I've been preaching and teaching for uh, 50 plus years. And you put your words out there and you put your ideas out there and sometimes you get a note back. Sometimes somebody says something, but when Julaine said that there were 13 of you meeting to watch the documentaries about 16 of 1619 and to discuss them in this tiny congregation, I was just overwhelmed and so touched. Not that I'm taking full credit for it, which I'm obviously trying to do, but, <laughs> um, it's just wonderful. And those of you who don't know about it, it's in, this, in the email that June sent out and you can check with Julaine or any, anybody. Um, um, the sculpture, Sharon, do you want to say what's behind that? Uh, that's, uh, uh, Tony brought it in for our service last week on women. And I believe she got it in, was it Thailand? Yeah. She did not make it herself, but um, she brought it. Yes. Absolutely beautiful. Can the Zoom audience see it? Yeah? Yeah, yeah they, can they can, see. right. Okay, good. Good. Um, and uh, a shout out to Louise in Ireland. She always dresses for church, whether she's in person or on Zoom, and she has her traditional hat on, and that just makes my day as well. And of course, to my son, Matthew, who I just noticed is, is there. I can't see all of you on Zoom, otherwise I'd shout out to each one of you. Jake's here too. Oh, oh yes, you can see both it. sons, Jacob and Matthew. This is a, a special uh, time for our family this week, and it's very special that they're both here this morning. I appreciate that. Let us begin our worship. All loving thread of this planet, 
Divine connectedness of March, beauty pouring into spring. Power of justice and light. Be with us this morning as we rest for a while in your embrace. In the safety of community, in the magnificent diversity of your creation. Be with us as we express gratitude, as we rejoice at all we have been given, the abundance from which we are all so well nourished and of which we are a part. Help us to be present and listening to each other, to the returning birds, to the silence of your steady presence. Amen. Well, for the Zoom audience, outside is drippy, dark, and gloomy March weather. And Julianne, that was such a fabulous break from the weather <laughs> and a, a celebration of what's to come. So uh, three women, <laughs> what was I thinking? It, I am overwhelmed with the material this morning. I just confess it. It's not an apology, but I'm just saying. Um, so um, the story today, I wanna to talk about Ida B. Wells. I've been doing informal uh, canvassing and lots of us don't know much about her. I am recently uh, researching her and um, I'm overwhelmed by how I could not have known more about her sooner. Um, so I'm gonna just tell a, a story or two about her in this slot of story time, uh, and then I'll get back to her in the sermon. But talking about all three of these women when each of them deserves five or six or seven or 10 sermons each is, has been really uh, tricky. Uh, and so, uh, Ida B. Wells was born in 1862 into slavery. Her father was the son of the slave owners and a slave woman mother. Um, she experienced reconstruction. There were, as you know, church groups, et cetera, that came down to set up schools. Um, the two main changes in reconstruction was that uh, African-Americans could all of a sudden marry for the first time and they could be educated for the first time. 90% of the four and a half million slaves in this country were illiterate at the time of emancipation. So she and her mother went to school together. Her parents married right away. Um, and uh, they, uh, she and her mother studied. Um, uh, she went to visit her grandmother in 1878 and tragically her parents and her brother, one of her siblings were uh, died in the yellow fever epidemic in uh, Mississippi. She took over care, she had to stop working and took over care of her other siblings. In 1921, it was the beginning of her first activism Days. And this is a story I'd like to just focus on. There's so many stories that I won't be able to tell this morning. I promise you I'll get back to you uh, with, with more on Ida B. Wells. But she was, um, so during Reconstruction, there was the, the middle class African-Americans had uh, their day, um, which of course, when Jim Crow came in, um, devastated by that. But uh, for uh, that little window, um, and one of the things that Ida B. Wells loved was clothing. And so she dressed the part. And she took a train uh, one day at age 21 um, and sat in the, the uh, first class car. And she had a ticket for that car. And the conductor came along and said, no, 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 you've got to go sit. You're in the wrong car. You've got to go. Various accounts I've heard of you go into the quote colored car or into the smoking car, etc. Anyway, she resisted and she fought back, literally bit the conductor on the hand, 
and was forcibly, with three other people helping, uh, forcibly thrown off the train. He then sued the railroad company. And won. The $500 settlement. This is 1884, predating Rosa Parks by how many years? I'll let you do the math. This was in Tennessee, however, and so the Supreme Court of Tennessee overthrew the, her victory. In 1889, she wrote, so, so she wrote about that, and that began her journalist career. And she was um, most well known for her writing uh, the rest of her life, criticizing the Memphis school system, thereby losing her job within it, uh, but became editor and, on, and chief writer of uh, many publications. And uh, um, I'm gonna leave it there for now and we'll get back to her a little bit later. Now is the time for the affirmation. You're Sharon, you're gonna lead that? Yeah. It says Sharon. Okay, <laughs> first I heard of it. Oh, it's wonderful to see all these faces here and up there. Would you join with me in saying our affirmation? And the reason that we're all here is Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve the needs of all beings to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with the source of our being. Thank you. And next, I see people reaching for donations to this church uh, for our ongoing work and food for the Family Center. Thank you. And a shout out to Bill. I love your guitar. It's so wonderful. All right. So the readings today are from the letters of Rachel Carson to her beloved Dorothy Freeman. And I want to give you a little bit of background on this. This is a um, a deep felt. Um, uh, so Rachel, Rachel Carson is a, my hero of heroes. And um, I'm going to assume that most of you know that she's essentially understood as a mother of environmentalism in the United States. Um, and that she wrote Silent Spring, which was the beginning of the new era. And it came out in 63, 64. She was on television. She testified before Congress and John F. Kennedy famously. Uh, uh, acknowledged her and began the EPA, et cetera. Um, she uh, had a wonderfully strong mother who typed all her manuscripts until the day she died. Uh, they have a very strong relationship. And she also, Rachel, fell in, fell in love with 
Dorothy Freeman um, in the last part of her life. They were very, very close friends. They, they uh, the granddaughter of Dorothy Freeman wrote, uh, pulled together the surviving letters um, of the two of them. Um, it's very clear, we know that they burned many of their letters and that they wrote two letters. Be, uh, Dorothy was married, Stan Freeman, and, that, and Rachel was very close to him as well, but they wrote, Rachel, they, they wrote, she wrote two letters every time she wrote Dorothy. And one was a private letter and one, and they burned all the private letters. Um, and, but even the letters that have survived, it's very clear how in love they were with each other and how crucial Dorothy Freeman was to the writing of all of Rachel's books, but particularly Silent Spring. Um, this relationship is very much downplayed in every author that I've read. Sadly. So I want to read two excerpts. One is from a letter she wrote February 6th. It's a very famous letter called the Hyacinth Letter. And it's a, a, one of the many letters that is clearly a love letter. But I, I'm going to skip over that part, um, although I'll bring it to coffee hour. Anyone wants to read it. But I want to read the section where she talks about creative writing, creative writing. Uh, by the way, Rachel Carson went to Chatham College, where she was going to major in English and where she perfected her writing skills. And then I think sort of fell in love with her science teacher and then fell in love with science and, and moved there. But because the reason she had such a huge influence was because she was not only a scientist par excellence, but also a fabulous writer. And my first teaching job was at Chatham College. So there's a um, much after Rachel was there. She writes to Dorothy, I don't suppose anyone really knows how a creative writer works. He or she least of all, perhaps. Or what sort of nourishment this spirit must have. All I am certain of is this, that it is quite necessary for me to know that there is someone who is deeply devoted to me as a person and who also has the capacity and the depth of understanding to share vicariously the sometimes crushing burden of creative effort. Recognizing the heartache, the great weariness of mind and body, the occasional black despair in it may involve, someone who cherishes me and what I am trying to create as well. Last summer, I was feeling as never before that there was no one who combined all of that. I had always known such understanding of these things from my mother, but that was becoming so dim as to know and for what reason. The few who understood the creative problem were not people to whom I felt emotionally close. Those who loved the non-writer part of me did not, by some strange paradox, understand the writer at all. I guess this is part of the love letter. <laughs> my intro was sorry. Um, and then, my dear one, you came into my life. <clears throat> I just want to keep reading the letter, but I'm going to resist. And I want to switch to another letter she wrote uh, later um, to Dorothy. This is in. Um, 1958, when she was beginning to work on Silent Spring, right before she began to work on Silent Spring. Um, and what I want, to, want you to hear in this letter is this, well, I'll just read it. I have been mentally blocked for a long time, first because I didn't know just what it was I wanted to say about life, and also for a reason more difficult to explain. Of course, everyone knows by this time that the whole world of science has been revolutionized by events of the past decade or so. Keep in mind, she's writing this in 1958. I suppose my thinking began to be affected soon after atomic science was firmly established. Some of the thoughts that came were so unattractive to me that I rejected them completely 
But the old ideas die hard, especially when they are emotionally as, as well as intellectually dear to one. It was pleasant to believe, for example, that much of nature was forever beyond the tampering reach of man. He might level the forests and dam the streams, but the clouds and the rain and the wind were gods. And God, a positive, possessive. The God of your ice crystal cathedral in that beautiful passage of the recent letter. It was comforting to suppose that the stream of life would flow on through time in whatever course that God had appointed for it without interference by one of the drops of the stream. By the way, in the stream, in, in, the, in her first book, The Sea Around Us, she has this gorgeous paragraph similar to what she's saying here, where she says, man will mess up lots of things, but they'll never be able to hurt the ocean. It's one of the most heartbreaking paragraphs I've ever read. And to suppose, let me back up. It was comforting to suppose that the stream of life would flow on through time and whatever course that God had appointed for it without interference by one of the drops of the stream, man. And to suppose that however, the physical environment might mold life, that life could never assume the power to change drastically or even destroy the physical world. These beliefs have almost been part of me for as long as I have thought about such things. To share them even vaguely threatened was, thre vaguely threatened was so shocking that as I have said, I shut my mind, refused to acknowledge that I couldn't help see what I couldn't help seeing. But that does no good, and I have now opened my eyes and my mind. I may not like what I see, but it does no good to ignore it, and it's worse than useless to go on repeating the old eternal verities that are no more eternal than the hills of the poets. So it seems time someone wrote of life in the light of the truth as it now appears to us. And I think that may be the book I am to write. One last. I still feel there is a case to be made for my old belief that as man approaches the quote, new heaven and new earth, unquote, or the space age universe, if you will, he must do so with humility rather than arrogance. And along with humility, I think there is still a place for wonder. Please join me in the spirit of meditation. Divine thread that gently nudges us now and then in the right direction. Divine thread that draws us to our better selves, that sings to us without words and without judgment. We throw our words into your silence. We craft gentle requests, not in a desire to control outcomes, but in our need to remember acceptance and trust. Let us be together in the silence of your embrace. Somebody pray for me, had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. 
I'm so glad they prayed for me. We have a hymn that Hallie's mother wrote. It's uh, entitled Women. It's in the yellow songbook. Hopefully you have that on your chairs. And uh, it's, it's mostly about uh, women's suffrage, um, but just celebrating women, the women who came before us and all the work that they've done to make our world the way it is now. mother who I knew years ago. Is Hallie here? Are you? Yeah. Oh. Well, okay. Oh dear, here we are. <laughs> All right. Three women. Three women. I imagine them. I see them alone at night. One by candlelight, one in hiding, one deathly ill. Each risking her life, literally risking her life to get the truth on paper. Each confident that words matter. From whence such courage, such confidence, such tenacity? And how do they inform and inspire us today in this our age of infinite words and printed instantly, of infinite words printed instantly into virtual space, this age of misinformation gone mad, the age of truthiness, this age of artificial intelligence? artificial intelligence. When we lose our way, it is often helpful to try to find the thread, to pick up the stitch we dropped, to backtrack far enough to find the fork in the road that we missed. The earlier version 
that has been lost. These three women writing, I, Ida B. Wells, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Rachel Carson. I repeat their names out loud. Ida B. Wells, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Rachel Carson. Mantras, our mothers, intellectuals, activists, people of faith. Each deserves a lifetime of study, and this morning I have only time to barely introduce them. I'm also addressing a question I will not be able to answer this morning, but for more than a few gestures toward possibility, from whence such courage and confidence. But if only we can be introduced this morning, we still need to know these women and all the beings they speak for. And we need to soak up their inspiration and their faith, especially in these dry times, these times rich with noise, short on truth, riddled with dogma. If communities like this are to survive, we must do exactly what you are doing in your 1619 study project. We must learn, share, support each other in understanding and vision. Let us this morning, let these three women inspire and renew our faith. Let's start with the Chicago's World's Fair, 1893, Columbian Exposition. An entire city is built called the White City to show off capitalism, the greatness of the United States of America. People come from all over the world, the glory of capitalism. And if you have not read Eric Larson's The Devil in the White City, run and get that book. It's a fabulous book and, and fabulous focus on this, the Chicago World's Fair. My maternal grandmother, upper middle class Chicago suburb of Winnetka, went to that fair probably several times as a teenager with her parents, no doubt. But I have proof that she was there because I have a spoon from the Women's Pavilion at the World's Fair. That's a whole nother story. A woman architect created a huge event. There was a whole building for women. My grandmother attended and so did Ida B. Wells. But Wells' experience, of course, was entirely different. Instead of finding herself and the glory of her people reflected back at her, as my grandmother found, Wells finds nothing about the successes of Blacks in the, in the 30 years since the end of slavery. And there had been many, many incredible advances. Frederick Douglass, one of the most famous orators of his day, black or white, was given no venue at the fair to speak, except one, the Haiti Pavilion. Here alone was there something about her people. Here alone was Douglass allowed to speak so what does this 30-year-old Ida B. Wells do? When she comes to the World's Fair and is so shocked that there is no holding up of the successes of her people, she writes a 90-page book called The Reason Why the Colored American is Not in the World's Columbian Exposition. And then she stands in front of the Haiti Pavilion and hands these out, having raised the money to pay for it, hands these out to everybody that comes. And when that's not enough, she travels to Europe and spreads the word. 10,000 copies were distributed.
Some years after the World's Fair, my grandmother marched for suffrage in Chicago. So did Ida B. Wells. How different that experience must have been. Especially when the Illinois contingent went to walk to march in Washington, D.C. And when they got there, the heads of the march said that the colored contingent, the colored part of the Illinois contingent would not march because it would offend the Southern marchers. So Ida B. Wells and her, her other quote, colored women backed off, went around a few city blocks, joined the march, joined the Illinois delegation in the march a few blocks down past, out of sight of the, the leaders of the march. And then years later, Wells takes up the subject of lynching. She's, she's writing all the time, editorials, articles, all the time. But her no, other fam most famous book was entitled Southern Horrors and Mob Rule in New Orleans. She researched, um, she was run out of the South, by the way. And so her, um, that was 30 years before she was able to sneak back to do an amazing thing in Arkansas, which is another day. But she wrote this book on lynching and when it didn't get the publicity, and she very meticulously researched. So as you all know, lynching is, is the hanging, burning, murdering, shooting, whatever of, of uh, somebody without trial, right? So she, and, and it was rampant in the South, part of Jim Crow and uh, the, that intimidation and terror to keep blacks down and uh, away from voting. Um, and it was often, they, they were often, these, the black men were often accused of raping white women. And that, that was, Ida B. Wells uh, admits that she actually believed that herself. Like everybody believed that. Like that was a general belief. Sorry, I have to repeat that it because it's so startling. She was one of the first people to say, wait a minute, and, and research, talk to enough people, research, 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 uh, and to dare to say that first it was mostly made up, but in some cases it was about women's sexual, the white woman's sexuality. And you can imagine the react, response she got to that. In any case, this book, she writes this book, it's not well received in the United States. And so she goes to Europe again and, and with the idea of telling the world about the shame of the United States. And it actually worked. It had effect back home. Um, lynching, as you well know, is still alive, but very much reduced. By the time of her death in 1931, it was very much reduced. Eleanor Roosevelt, by the way, you'll remember, fought for um, uh, a federal anti-lynching law for years and years and years. Uh, never got it passed. Ida B. Wells was uh, too radical for her time. She was one of the founders of the NAACP, but through political shenanigans was pushed off because she was too radical. She was tipping the boat too much. That's always been an issue, of course, in any movement. And, um, and she was pretty much wa washed out of history. Major history of Black America um, came out before she died, and she was not in it. Uh, and her children and grandchildren have been trying to rectify that ever since, thank goodness. All right, let's switch now to, to Gilman, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. <laughs> How many of you know about her? One, okay. Zoom, any hands up? No, yes, yes, a few, okay. Um, 1860 to 1934, almost the exact same dates of Ida B. Wells. Grew up from a, from a Brahmin family, <clears throat> um, but poor. Father was a ne'er-do-well, left her and her mother alone. Again, a very strong mother. 
She wrote in her lifetime the equivalent of some 30 books, ranging from poetry to economics, including masterpieces such as the yellow wallpaper um, and her delightful and very timely utopian novel, Her Land, and her most famous book, Women in Economics, which was read um, throughout the 20s. She was one of the best known writers and lecturers in the women's movement during the first part of the century. Quote, the Marx Veblen of the women's movement. She was the most original and challenging mind that the movement produced. The, quote, the leading intellectual in the women's movement during the first two decades of the 20th century. Women in Economics was translated into six languages and served as a Bible for many suffragists and feminists for many, many years. It was a standard text throughout the 20s. Her fictional piece, Yellow Wallpaper, um, and Her Land were our standard texts to this day for English and women's studies classes across this country. I'll say briefly, just a, a briefly about those two books. Yellow Wallpaper is a short story and, and very autobiographical about her mental breakdown after she had her daughter, her child. Uh, some people call it postpartum depression. I think that's a misnomer in this case. Um, but she vividly describes, it's a fictionalized account, but it was, it's very accurate. It describes herself literally so desperate she crawled around the room, around the edge of the room like, like an animal. And she describes this in this story. She would, in those days, the cure for depression, what they called hysteria, based on the word um, uh, for uterus, which I'm blanking on. Anyway, uh, the, the, the depression was because the uterus was wrong, uh, something was wrong with the uterus in women. And so uh, the cure was to forbid any intellectual work whatsoever. So she was, uh, the sicker she got, the stronger the psychiatrist at the Weir, the leading psychiatrist in the country, um, advocated that she not be allowed to write, which of course made her crazier. Um, she sent, when she finished this, this short story, she sent it to Dr. Weir and uh, he changed his, changed his treatment of women on the basis of this. Pretty powerful. And her uh, Utopian Herland, which I would encourage anyone to read, um, she imagines three men in a plane crash on an island that is entirely women and parthenogenesis is miraculously happening. So they are flourishing culture with generations, uh, all women. What do you suppose is the most important, the highest valued thing in this culture? Anybody? Zoom audience? Um, friendship. A culture run by women. Friendship. Children. Education. It is the complete flip of capitalism as we know it today. It is the complete flip. And it's well worth reading. It's, it's hardly dated at all. I trust no one here, I want to focus though on her work. I trust no one here doubts that her ideas that women and men, uh, uh, the, the importance for women and men of women being able to vote, being able to engage in intellectual pursuits, having economic independence, being as free as possible from mindless labor, at least as free as their male counterparts. I trust no one here doubts the importance of how generally, now generally held belief, which was not generally held in her day, that women and men can both love and work. That was a radical statement in her day. And on Mother's Day, I will be, uh, oh, I'm not here on Mother's Day. Well, close to Mother's Day, whenever I'm here next in May, um, I'll be reading a poem of hers about that very thing. But how, did, the question of the morning is, how did she have the courage to choose the important, how did she have the courage to choose what was important over what was urgent? To choose love over the pettiness of daily work. 
which of course she still had to do. But what happened to her? What did she do to give herself the power to do what was wholly unexpected, unacceptable and shocking to her generation? What gave her the courage to listen to her heart? And the answer is very simple in Charlotte Perkins Gilman. She got a divorce. Years ago, I gave a, a sermon on Charlotte Perkins Gilman in which I focused on this divorce and the importance of it for freeing her. And a few months later, a colleague of mine came up to me and said, thanks a lot for that sermon you gave a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, my wife has divorced me. I guess that's not so funny, is it? One has to be careful. Uh, she later told me it was the best thing she could have done, so. She divorced from a marriage that was literally driving her mad. What allowed her the courage to get divorced, which of course was not an acceptable thing in the 1890s, was that she suffered this nervous breakdown, this quote, nervous prostration, which doctors called hysteria, what we now call depression. She went as far as she could go, she wrote, without and still be able to come back. She had married at age 24. Prior to this marriage, she had led a highly intellectual and stimulating life in the circle of New England intellectuals. Among others, her two great aunts, Catherine Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe. Both women of astonishing energy, radical commitments and intellectual accomplishment. They had a tremendous influence on her, needless to say. At age 21, she was busy from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. with lectures, clubs, physical fitness training, language classes, and history science reading groups. The breakdown which followed her marriage and the birth of her child was deeply rooted in this contradiction between love and work. The expected women's role to love of the late 19th century and her own wish to fulfill that role on the one hand, and her work, her deep intellectual creativity and need to write on the other. She left marriage and in the first, and she traveled uh, to her friend Channing's out in California. And in that first year, just to give you an idea, she wrote 33 short stories, 33 poems, and 10 children's verses. I said earlier that of the three women that she wrote in hiding, um, and she did, she, she literally had to, to, when she was still under the thumb of her husband and doctor, she, was, she, she would sneak where she could to write. But when she was finally free in California, uh, um, it just poured out of her. She made the decision to leave because she had to, it appears. And she was lucky in that regard. Few of us have such clear cut choices. Either you do what you were meant to do or you go insane. But it is a theme which comes up over and over again. This theme that the only way across is the way under. The only way up is to bottom out. The only way to life is through the knowledge of death. A friend of mine, after reading some of my sermons a while ago, commented, Nancy, you seem to have a kind of black streak that pops up now and then, a bleakness which seems to contradict your apparent joyfulness and enthusiasm for life. I was taken aback and panicked. Oh no, I thought, some tragic flaw I haven't been aware of. But after a few days, I decided I wanted to defend this little black streak. I wanted to defend it as a source of my enthusiasm. And I want to say that Charlotte Perkins Gilman crawling around that room in utter despair had to plunge the depths of her psyche in order to have the courage to counter the cultural assumptions she fought. 
the courage and the immensity of the challenge which she assumed and carried through to her death cannot be measured by any other standard than one which is rooted beyond the spatio-temporal matrix of our ordinary lives. She had to drop out of that busyness. She had to leave the normal, the cheerful, the expected, the urgent, to get to the plane on which creativity is possible. She had to go into the wilderness to hear the devil himself, to come back so extraordinarily changed. We do not become ourselves fully without doing this in some form or other. We do not change in some such a profound way without a relationship, without a rootedness and encounter with the other with the cosmic. Think about Moses. Minding his business, taking care of the sheep. And then all hell breaks loose. This bush talks to him. The dilemma which Charlotte Perkins Gilman struggled with her whole life, how could a woman love and work both? This is the primary contradiction posed to women all along. It is still the primary dilemma of every woman. And how shall I put this? And men, it's complicated. She was able to overcome this contradiction as all of us are able to overcome contradictions only by going, quote, insane, by leaving the world of culturally defined and returning to birth and beginning again, the crawling image to struggle to free her creative side, this divine genius within her. And then there was Rachel. Nineteen oh seven to nineteen sixty four. Small town in Pittsburgh, ne'er do well father, fabulous mother, lover of nature, the mother, very much in the uh, tradition of teaching children about nature. Uh, I've told you she went to Chatham, she went on to uh, John Hopkins became a scientist and wrote these wonderful books about the ocean, the sea around us, the edge of the sea. Um, and then she had friends, and she had scientific women science friends, and women and men, but also uh, the Audubon Society, which was primarily women at that time, um, feeding her a lot of information about this horrible chemical DDT. She was very aware of other environmental devastation, but DDT was particularly acute. <clears throat> um, and so she wrote E.B. White at the New Yorker and said, you need to write a, an expose article about DDT. And E.B. White in his great wisdom wrote back and said, I think you should write it. And so began this, her writing of this famous book, Silent Spring, in which <clears throat> She used all her poetic ability and all her genius to write what she referred to with Dorothy as the poison book. And you can imagine, or please, I invite you to imagine the difference between writing a book about the sea in which you glorify 
and detail the animals and the vegetation and how beautiful the sea is. And you've written three of these books now. And then you take on the chemical companies. You take on the flip side of that glory, the devil itself that's poisoning the earth. It was a grueling task and a horrendous choice. Dorothy argued, tried to get her not to write it. She was so fearful of what it would do to her. And she was also suffering from cancer throughout that, kept it entirely secret because since the chemical companies were already after her, she was sure that they would uh, use her cancer against her in the most vile of ways that you can imagine. This courage, to spend daily, nightly, all day, all night working on this text. She was a perfectionist. If you've read the book, and if you haven't, by the way, it's totally relevant today. Uh, they just found barrels of DDT in the, off the coast of California, by the way. Um, and it's still with, in our bodies all over the place, along with other things. Um, the, the courage to write this book, the courage, this, Let me read you uh, a piece I wrote about her in my journal. I am on the verge of tears, always, even thinking about her. Her delicate features, her little body, bright, clear eyes, all of which I know only from reading about her, staring at photos of her, imagining her working in an office of hunters and fishermen, then alone, alone, she seems so delicate, so elfin, and yet out of this fragile, dying woman comes this book, comes this stand against capitalism, against arrogance in defense of nature, whom few understood to even need defense at the time. Out of this frail body comes voice, condemn a condemnation of silence, not only the silence of no birds, but the silence of those who do not speak truth to power, who do not speak for those on this planet who cannot speak. The silence of complicity. How did she do that? I've given you two hints, her mother and the woman that she loved. Dorothy Freeman. But how much, I, we, we can keep asking that question because there's there's got to be more as well. So Wells, Ida B. Wells, outraged, her love of her people. I can also imagine that her courage came from the thrill of writing itself, the power of her language. Finding the words that you know just right. What else drove her? The hubris of white men, I imagine. The hubris of white men. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, sanity, desperation, drove her. The need to express herself, the outrage, the need to help other women, the hubris of men. I hasten to say not all men. And Carson, outrage drove her of what was being done to the earth. Nuclear bombs, DDT, loss of habitat, the hubris of the human species, speciesism. Her books all were addressed to that arrogance and they all called for humility and wonder. Each, each had made acts of personal decision 
humbly and privately, these personal decisions were made not because they sought to change the world by making them, made because they would go mad without making them, because the world without their acts looked meaningless. Of course, they had no idea the effects of their words, made because, which is why the question is so urgent. How did they, how did they have the courage to do this not having any idea of the outcome? These personal decisions on a daily basis, yes, I will write today. I will continue working on this book though. I am, can hardly sit in a chair anymore. I'm so disabled and decayed from cancer. These decisions made because the spirit took them into the wilderness and they could see only one way out. Might we not let the spirit lead us where it will? And so begin, as Rilke writes, our long love toward God. Our long love toward God, that silent work undertaken without thought of ever reaching its goal, end quote. What, lies, what lives on most for me and these women is this transition, this move they made from the expected to the important the breakdown, the letting go, the days and months of crying, the agony of birthing the self, then which made them whole. Their long love toward God, from which came their work. They lived that identity of love and work utterly and completely. And I am convinced they were able to do so only because they transferred their basis of being from the practical, from the socially expected to the spiritual, from the spatio-temporal rational to the heartfelt active. These are not their words. This, as I see it, was their lives. Whichever of these women speak to you, I urge you to adopt one of them as your mentor. We're not all writers, but we are all rolled, we all, we all roll up our sleeves to help in some way. This is our Unitarian tradition. Our faith in our actions is in our actions. So my simple message this morning is to urge you to take one of these stories, explore the details, find yourself in them, the quote or the daring that speaks most clearly to you and let it support and inspire each of us to keep faith to keep up the good fight, to support each other in our creativity and our struggle for justice and for truth. Somebody marched for me, had me on their mind, took the time and marched for me. I'm so glad they marched. I'm so glad they marched. I'm so glad they marched for me. Somebody marched for me, had me on their mind, took the time and marched for me. I'm so glad they marched. I'm so glad they marched. I'm so glad they marched for me. Blessed earth, blessed soil ready to burst forth, blessed spirit of justice, truth, and beauty, be with us as we leave this sacred place, as we venture back into our lives and our myriad relations, that we might remember the spirit and the call of this morning's gathering, that we might follow in the footsteps and hear the call of those who have gone before us. Amen.